Hello, my name is Archan Sen, and today I'm going to be talking about theory. So first, uh, we're just going to start with a quick roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to first talk about what is theory, then why you should deploy or at least learn how to deploy theory. Then we're going to talk about the different parts that there are to theory. And then finally, we're going to learn how to actually, you know, use this in around how to deploy theory. So first, we start off with what is theory. Theory is essentially the question of should what my opponent did be allowed in debate? And it could be a lot of different things that are already circulating around the circuit. For example, disclosure, should there be round reports, open source, et cetera? Um, is paraphrasing a good thing or bad thing? Should it be allowed in PF? Should it be um, continued? Or it could be something that's not that big yet, such as card ethics. For example, should there be ellipses in paragraphs? Can you like switch around and like move from one part to the next without indicating that to the audience? And you know, some of these have pretty clear answers already, but teams will still try to take advantage of them, which is why deploying theory is critical, which brings us into our next point of why you should learn to learn, you should uh, learn theory. So there's a couple of reasons. First is that even if you hate theory and you never want to read it, you still need to know how to defend against it. Otherwise, you'll just keep losing to frivolous theory interpretations. It's becoming bigger and bigger in PF as it becomes more and more tech, which means that it's critical to learn how to use it. Otherwise, you'll be at a strategic disadvantage when other teams will be able to read it against you and you won't know how to respond. Second is that it'll deter teams. It'll ensure they use good practices against you and not the theoretically illegitimate ones that might give them an advantage um, in the debate. So if you get good at like say paraphrasing bad, then that means that teams will stop paraphrasing against you because they know that they'll lose if they do it in front of you. Um, however, on the flip side, if you don't know how to go for theory, teams will do the opposite. They will be abusive to you and they'll do theoretically illegitimate things in order to make it easier for them to win. Um, and then finally, it's another way out. Um, if you're losing all the substance, you don't know what happened, they like broke a new advantage or something like that, then that means that you'll always be able to have another way to go for, you'll have a way to make all of that go away if you just go for theory, which means that all the substance that they had previously in the debate will just vanish. Um, in my opinion, theory is one of the best tools that you can master, especially as PF becomes more and more tech because it'll err more and more towards this. Um, and you'll see this in increasingly surprising ways that you won't. For example, interpretations of the resolution, what does the resolution mandate? What does it allow? Um, all of this will become theory debates that you'll need to be prepared for. Um, so next we'll talk about the different parts of theory. Um, so this is going to start to be the implementation of theory. So I'm gonna analogize all of these uh, theory parts to different parts in debate that you already know of, because I think that they're largely the same and it really helps to think of them as this. So first we start with the interpretation. The interpretation is functionally the new resolution. So instead of debating for whether or not the US should say increase troop presence in West Asia, you're now debating whether or not it should be a rule that teams need to disclose on their wikis. So this is a new thing that one team is defending and the other team says that we should keep the status quo. So there's two things that an interpretation should have. First is a clear bright line, and second is elegance. So good interps need a bright line, i.e. a way to determine whether the rule that you're proposing has been violated. If it's easy to morph into it, then that means that A, it'll become unenforceable as an interp, which means that teams will just say that they need it, even if they might not, but B, it becomes more arbitrary, which we'll talk about later and why that's an interp. So what are some examples of this? Um, an example of a clear interp is saying something like, teams should disclose on the wikis with open sourcing all the cards they read, um, because it means that it's very easy to determine whether or not this has been done, and it's very clear to see whether a team's violated that. A bad example is something like, teams should disclose early enough to prepare for the debate, because no one really knows what that means. Like, what is early enough to prepare for the debate? A team, if they disclose, like, say, like, 20 minutes before the round on the wiki might say that that's enough. You had 20 entire minutes to like go through a wiki, look at what we've done, stuff like that, which means that you need to have a clear bright line, um, something that can be like easily determined. Um, lastly, interrupts need to be elegant. That means that they need to have minimal words and qualifiers. Um, I an interrupt that's like teams need to open source is better than teams need to open source the night after they read it, just because the more qualifiers you add, the more arbitrary it becomes, um, which is, you know, worse as an interpretation. So next is the violation. The violation is like the link. It says that X ought to be a rule, or X is a rule, and the reason that it matters in this round is because they violated X. So it's the reason that the affirmative or negative links to your theory interpretation. 
Um, if facing a good team, most of the time will not be sent on the violation because the team will have a clear bright line, as we talked about earlier, um, but they'll have a clear violation. So it's often the most underdeveloped parts of theory debates and honestly, uh, one of the most, one of the least useful parts. Um, however, the next part that we talk about, standards, is the biggest thing in a theory debate. So standards are the inputs. Um, this is the reason that your interp is better than your opponent's interp. Uh, there are three main ones that people read, which are fairness, education, clash. And a quick way to really elevate your theory debating is to be able to do impact calculus between these. For example, you can say like fairness outweighs education because if debate wasn't fair, then it would turn into a lecture where we wouldn't gain anything unique. Similarly, you can say like clash outweighs education because it's a prereq to how we get education in the first place, i.e. debating about it is necessary in order to gain education. Um, and all of these are really important to do because it makes you, because it allows you to determine which standard is the biggest in the round and which standard the judge should care about the most. So it's kind of like probability, um, uh, probability magnitude time frame, except now it's in theoretical terms. Um, the last thing I'll say on here before we get into how to actually deploy theory is that the scope of the internal links is key. What this means is basically the amount of fairness that they decrease, the amount of education that they decrease, or the amount of clash that they decrease is a critical component that teams rarely talk about. This can easily make or break debates, especially in closed rounds. Let's say your team reads an interp of like teams must open source when you're defending a counter interpretation of teams must post sites. They can go on like a massive rant about how important disclosure is to fairness and how fairness is like the most important thing in the world. But that doesn't matter if you're able to say that the internal link, the scope of the internal link, the difference between open sourcing and sites is not that big, which means that a small risk of your offense would outweigh a large risk of their fairness offense, because even if fairness is important, the amount of fairness that they increase is very minimal. Okay, now let's talk about how to actually deploy theory. Um, this is gonna be the biggest part of the lecture as I think it's the most important part of the debate. And this is going to be the actual implementation of theory into debate. So first we'll talk about a couple of theory terms. Um, and this is just like generic offense you can use against pretty much any theory education, uh, theory interpretation, either if you're defending it or you're going for it. Um, and then we're also gonna go through this so that we have a common basis for what we're talking about. And these are ranked in terms of how good I think they are. So first is app or neg flex, uh, which flexibility, um, which is basically how much do they allow you to win? For example, um, if you're saying uh, flex, then you're saying that the negative is already winning a lot, which means that whatever you're doing is necessary to keep the app still in the game. For example, if you have a topicality argument about what the limits of the topic is, i.e. for a topic about Medicare for all, what a definition of Medicare for all is best and why, um, it's critical to determine which side is already behind in order to try to tip that needle back to 50-50. So normally in debates about affirmative or negative flexibility, it's always a question of uniqueness. A uniqueness is uh, the uniqueness question of which side is harder to be. And that's garnered by giving um, topic specific examples. It can be given by like structural examples, for example, like disclosure or uh, I don't know, the negative gets the last speech because they flipped second or something like that. Um, so the uniqueness question is critical in order to win affirmative or negative flexibility. Second is strategy skew. Um, strategy skew is basically the idea that uh, they made your strategy irreparable and it was impossible to come back from that moment in time. So for example, let's say that even though it's against the rules, your opponents decided to introduce a counter plan in front of a really tech judge that just uh, goes along with whatever happens in the debate. You say that it's unfair and then you say to reject the argument, not the team. So then that begs the question, why should you reject the team instead of the argument? The reason that you should reject the team is because they introduced something that it was impossible to come back from because after they read that counter plan, you needed to answer that counter plan and put theory on that counter plan when they could just like kick out of it with all of that not mattering, which means that it's skewed your strategy irreparably and made it impossible to come back from. Next is innovation, which is the argument that like your theory inter makes uh, new arguments easier to occur. Uh, for example, disclosure. Disclosure breeds more innovation because teams know what's already been read and can piggyback off other ideas that other people have. Next is real world. Um, the real world is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's just like this is what would happen um, if we actually tried to implement the plan um, outside of debate in Congress, for example. Um, so, for example, uh, theoretical debating about the plan's process for politics arguments, i.e. real world is to go at the bottom of the docket, not the top of the docket which means that all of their PC internal link stuff is bunk. 
uh, all their political capital stuff doesn't matter because the president would spend the political capital on the bill before they'd spend political capital on the plan. Uh, next is time skew. So this is like strat skew, but that it's that it takes up too much time and makes it impossible to debate. Um, I think that this is definitely a lot worse than strategy skew because time skew is probably inevitable. And we'll go on to that in the generic theory defense below. Uh, and then finally, we have hard debate is good. Uh, it's a pretty bad argument in my opinion, but a lot of teams say it still. The argument is that harder debate breeds more um, competitive focus and that encourages more faster and more analytical thinking which means that making it harder and harder to debate is better because it means that teams will you know, reach their peak, do the maximum amount of debating in order to win these debates. Um, and now we can go through a couple um, general theory, theory defenses. Uh, so these are also ranked in the order in which I think is best. First is arbitrariness, which is by far um, one of the most underutilized aspects in defense. Um, so it's basically saying that arbitrary interrupts are bad because they have no functional backing, which means that they'll always devolve further and further down, uh, which will crowd out substantive debate for a theoretical whining, i.e. the interrupt of like, teams must disclose 13.5 hours after reading a new card is pretty arbitrary, right? Why 13.5 hours? That's a random number that's contrived out of nowhere, which means that once you meet that 13.5 hours, hours, they're just going to shift their interrupt to 13 then to 12, then to 11, which makes it impossible to debate because you'll never know what the theory interp is before debating, which means that you never have a chance to meet it. So that's why I was talking about arbitrariness and all that stuff above, because the more arbitrary an interp is, the harder it is to defend. Um, next is reciprocity, which basically says that um, even if we're being abusive, they can be abusive too, which means that it kind of like cancels out. Uh, it means that both sides can do it, which means that it doesn't uniquely harm either side. Uh, so, for example, if you're trying to defend against a theory interrupt that says that paraphrasing is unfair, you can just say you can paraphrase back, which means that even if it is unfair to you, you can do it too, which means that it's unfair to us and everyone is still on an equal playing field. Finally, is skew inevitable. This is against strat skew and time skew. It basically says that uh, none of the offense is solved by interpretation. For example, time skew is inevitable when you inevitably like drop, when you inevitably like kick contentions or when you decide what arguments to go for and stuff like that which means that um, all of their offense can't be solved by their interpretation and is inevitably going to exist. So then we get to the question of competing interpretations or reasonability. Now, this is a theory debate about a theory debate. It's a question of how to evaluate theory in the first place, which means that it gets super meta at some point. Um, so competing interpretations says that you should evaluate theory just like you are out evaluate substantive arguments. You should not see, you should see which interp is best by evaluating the offense and the defense on the flow and seeing which comparative model would be the best for debate. On the other hand, reasonability says that theory debates are not the same as substantive debates and they're, they're unique. The best way to evaluate it is whether it's um, impossible to debate on the more restricting model. So winning reasonability benefits the side that's always defending against the theory violation. Um, I want to fight back against a common misperception here. It's not a question of what happened in the round. And reasonability is not like a counterinterpretation through a theoretical violation. Um, some teams use this as like a, we weren't abusive in this round, so don't put us down. That's not reasonability. What reasonability is saying is that if our model of debate doesn't make it impossible for the other side to win, then that's not a reason to vote us down. I.e., you should have a higher bar for theory than you should for substantive arguments because it crowds out the substantive arguments and the education that we actually get in the first place. So there's a couple of reasons to prefer each of them. Um, for reasonability, the first argument is substance crowd out, um, which is kind of what we were talking about before, ensures that the only theory debates that are necess that our necessities are red and not the frivolous theory debates, uh, because the frivolous ones would lose a, um, reasonability because it means that, you know, even if we made it marginally more unfair, like who cares? The benefits of educational, like substantive debate definitely outweigh. Um, second is race to the bottom. Teams will find increasingly stricter interps in order to limit out teams more and more, making it impossible to debate in the first place, which means that using a standard of reasonability sets the, bre sets the threshold much higher in order to win a theory debate, which means that marginal differences in theory interpretations won't really matter. Um, and then a reason to prefer competing interps, um, I think there's probably three. First is judge intervention. So whether it's uh, impossible to debate is largely arbitrary and impossible to like access pre the round because it determines on the judge's biases rather than like offense defense pair, uh, like debating, 
for example, what's impossible or what's like a high enough threshold? Is it like a 70% win percentage, 80%? It's impossible to determine from the get-go, which means that it causes pandering to judges' biases over, you know, technical actual debating. Um, secondly, is that the culmination of all individually reasonable rules would probably be unreasonable because all of them in conjunction isn't assumed by either team, which means that we should just set the best theory and trips overall in every single round in order to make the best model of debate. And third is a race to the top. So this is an impact turn to race to the bottom. And it basically says that a short-term proliferation of theory and trips is good because it causes a better model of debate to emerge. And then that model will stay around because teams know that if they deviate from that, i.e. they introduce a bad norm, then they'll automatically lose, which means that competing in trips is best in order to create the best model of debate that we can find. Um, next is, uh, in my opinion, one of the best theory in trips that there is, which is no non-resolutional theory, which basically says that, you know, all the theory in trips that are frivolous and arbitrary and that aren't about the resolution should not be evaluated in debate. So there's two main reasons for why this is good. Um, first is that non-resolutional theory and trips are arbitrary, i.e. that there's no backing for them um, at all. Like resolutional theory and trips would be something like, um, you know, West Asia means these set of countries and not this one, therefore your affirmative is illegitimate. However, a non-resolutional theory and trip would be something like socks theory or shoes theory or something that's like completely out there that has no backing. This means, that it'll always cause a race to the bottom in order to find uh, worse and worse theory in chirps, um, and is also unpredictable, which means that it's impossible to determine from before the round what theory in chirps you need to meet, which means that teams will always just like do some random thing, for example, A through Z spec or something that teams won't have prepared in order to get a technical advantage over the other team. This will always favor the team that introduces the theory in chirp, and means that it'll always crowd out substantive debating in favor of theoretical whining. Okay. The last thing that we're going to talk about today is RVI. Um, this is the idea that teams should lose if they introduce a theory enter and then proceed to lose that theory violation. So the biggest reason for why RVIs is good is because it deters bad theory norms, i.e. Um, if a team produces a model of debate and then they proceed to lose it, i.e. they uh, the opposing team wins that the model of debate that they introduced is bad, then that means that they should lose the debate for trying to shape community norms in a negative way. Um, it means that just like everything else, theory would now have an opportunity cost. So if you introduce a bad advantage, then that means that teams can straight turn it or impact turn it, and it means that they can stick you to that advantage, otherwise it becomes an advantage for them. However, for theory, there's nothing like that. If you introduce a bad theory violation and then a team beats you on it, that means that you just take the theory violation and you go for substance. This means that it's pretty easy to just like be abusive and spam theory violations because even if you lose it, it's a no risk option. RVIs change that and it says that if you lose a theory violation, that should be a reason that you lose too, which means that all the bad theory norms that are being proliferated would decrease. Um, the reason against RVIs, in my opinion, is more intuitive. Uh, there's a couple. First is that it deters theory and chirp. So this is an impact turn to what I was saying earlier which is bad because it means that teams won't introduce these theory interpretations anymore, which means that the good norms won't be created. Uh, so we won't be able to actually find the best model debate like there is because teams will be too afraid to introduce the theory interests in the first place. Second is that teams will bait theory. Uh, so they'll do purposely illegit things in order to get other teams to read theory against them. And then they'll just go for the RBI. The argument for this is empirically proven as this happened a lot in LD, where teams just like read cheating arguments, other teams read um, theory against it, and then they just went for the RBI and consistently won, which means that it encourages bad models of debating where teams purposely do things that make it harder for the opponents to win. Okay. Um, I think that's my time. So thanks so much for listening to this lecture.